Uh, my name is Steve Bradshaw. All right, so you, as you can see, we have an agenda here. So this is the meeting call to order. Then we'll do a brief welcome. We do have our normal general announcements to make, so we'll be doing that. Um, nothing particularly out of the ordinary tonight, so you'll see a lot of the same announcements that you normally see. Uh, we do have a member presentation tonight. So Tom Polakis is here. He's going to talk to us a little bit uh, about, uh, uh, as you can see, augmenting time lapse imaging results with uh, catalog data. So anyway, I'm not even sure what that means. So I'm really anxious to see what Tom has to say about it. So anyway, um, we also then are going to have our seventh inning stretch. So we'll take about a 15 minute break so you can take a you know, restroom break, get some libation, uh, stretch, whatever. And then we'll have our main presentation night, uh, who is, uh, you can see up there is Jeca Jessica Berkheimer. She's actually right here. And uh, she'll be talking to us. She's a PhD student out at ASU. And she's going to talk about some volunteer opportunities, way to get involved in citizen science and stuff if you're interested in that sort of thing. So anyway, let's go ahead and get going here. So first of all, uh, formal welcome to everybody. So welcome to those that are in the room tonight. We are, once again, a little lightly attended because of weather, but uh, welcome to everybody. Um, welcome to everybody out there on Zoom as well. Um, uh, we're, we're, we thank everybody, whether you're here or there, for being with us tonight, so that's good. Uh, as always, uh, we hope you enjoy yourselves. Uh, we hope you learn something interesting. Uh, we hope you make a new friend. Uh, we hope you reconnect with old friends. And da da da. Uh, for tonight, we hope that you enjoy the new start time and end time. So rather than our 7:30 to 9:30, we're now doing seven and nine. So um, you all get an extra half hour of sleep tonight, courtesy of me. So anyway, as you get out of here a half hour early, enjoy your extra sleep. So uh, we didn't maybe get it with the time zone, time, change, uh, time zone change here in Arizona, but we'll get it through our meetings here. Um, anyway, any visitors here tonight? Just making a quick thing. Anybody here new tonight? Uh, I've got a few people here tonight. Um, so anyway, we got two. So welcome to our visitors. Um, uh, if you don't mind, we're going to embarrass you a little bit. We'd like you to introduce yourselves if you could. Um, so anyway, I got to get Woody. We're a little short-handed here tonight. Normally we have like three guys up here, and uh, two of them are sick tonight. So we're a little short-handed with things. So anyway, and to make it simple, there we're not even you know, just what's your name? How did you find us? What reason brought you here? What's your astronomy experience? Which could be nothing to I'm a working astronomer, because that's what we have in this room usually, uh, is nothing all the way to working astronomers. And if you have one, what's your favorite thing in or about space? So you're on. Oh, okay, I'm Denise Berkheimer, and this is my husband, Mark. I am not totally new, because I came when Roger spoke a few weeks ago, um, but this is our daughter, and we're here supporting her. Um, the experience I have is mainly with the knowledge that she shares with us. And um, the favorite thing about space is when she sets up her telescope and points out things for us to be able to observe. Okay, well, thank you. Welcome. All right, we had a couple other hands if you want to. Uh, okay, right there. Thanks. Um, hey, my name is Lance. Um, I am a member of this club, but this is the first time I've ever been here. Um, astronomy, I'm trying to learn, so I'm new to this. And um, just like looking at the stars, learning about gravity. Uh, gravity is a big green frog. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Rick, and how I found you was through an internet search. I used to live in Indiana about three weeks ago. I, I know I was moving over here to Chandler, so I did an internet search, and I joined the club in early February. And my astronomy experience, I'm just an amateur, but I've always loved it since I've been a young teenager. And my favorite thing about or in space are, I believe, the planets and space travel. And I also did just recently attend the Messier Marathon, and that was pretty enjoyable also. Okay. Welcome to everybody. So uh, to the to, uh, Lance, our, our member who's here tonight, and in the back there, welcome as well. And you too, thank you for lending your daughter to us tonight to talk. So we appreciate that. So. 
All right, let's uh, go ahead and move on. We got one more. Okay. Uh, my name is Eric Schaefer. I, I was here a few years ago, and I like astronomy. Um, I'm a, uh, I graduated ASU in physics. And okay, it's so like I also have a telescope, and I'm just trying to get it work working. Anybody else? We, I think we got everybody. I saw four hands. That was four people. Okay. Hang on just a second. Our AV guy is sick tonight, but he's texting me wildly. So, okay, got it. All right. So anyway, okay. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Let's uh, continue on here then tonight. Let's uh, get back over here to this screen. And uh, so we got some general announcements here to make. These are the same announcements we see most weeks. So, but Jason, we do have new people in the room. So we, we, we got to go through them. So number one, um, it is, uh, uh, what, about three months into the year now. So if you'd like to renew or join um, the club, uh, you could do so. Um, you can do it three different ways. Uh, you can do it in person here tonight. Uh, Brooks is in the back room of the room there at that table back there. And Brooks can uh, get you all signed up for membership there. And he would appreciate doing so. Um, notice also if you go out to our website, and that is a screen capture from our website, um, you can actually uh, join online or you can join via mail as well. So either way you want to do it, um, you, just, you can do it here or on the website. That's fine. Um, once you join, um, there is a link back. Let me back up one. Uh, you'll see over there, there's like a new member guide and a little blue box on the right hand side there. If you were to click on that, it brings up a little PDF and it tells you what it is to be a member and kind of what's involved and things like that. So that's online for you. Um, also, if you would then like to uh, find out what's happening here at EVAC, um, you can go out to our website, go to the homepage and click on subscribe. And you can actually subscribe to a mailing list. Um, we do not sell your email address anywhere, so we're not gonna be a spam machine for you. Um, you'll get probably four, five, six emails a month from us is all you'll get. But uh, most of these are gonna be announcements about events that are happening, whether it be this meeting or something special that's coming up or whatever. So you can actually have it, uh, what's happening here dropped into your mailbox automatically um, every week so that you don't have to go fish it out manually on your own. If you just don't like the idea of email though, uh, you can always go out to our website and go to the events and meetings page. And on that is uh, uh, a calendar. You can see a portion of the calendar there and it'll show you that month and anything that's happening that month. So you can get that out there as well. Um, also, you can always go to our new uh, news and resources page and we actually have a newsletter every month that goes out as well it would go out via the mailer uh, that you would have signed up for a couple of slides back but if you want to you can actually just pull the, the newsletters down off of our website as well and actually there's an archive out there of newsletters going back a few years so there's lots of stuff you can see there and it always tells about what's going on here as well um, if you uh, would like to get some equipment and you don't have any, uh, we can make that available to you as well. So James is our property manager. Usually he's sitting right here, but he's actually got a cold tonight. Um, he's terrible thing. He, he picked up a cold in Atacama, Chile on vacation last week. So uh, we're really feeling sorry for Tom, I mean, for uh, James, um, you know, to have to have a cold after a, a week in the, in the Chilean mountain deserts with his uh, tel telescope. Uh, James said it was wonderful. He's actually going to do a little member presentation for us next month. Uh, so we can see some of what he did. He says, you haven't lived until you've seen uh, Omega Centauri in a 20-inch uh, daub. He says it just took his breath away every time he saw it. So anyway, uh, so James will be here. But James takes care of all this. Uh, we get equipment all the time from various sources and places. Uh, we check it over. James specifically checks it over, makes sure it's functional or whatever. And then we go ahead and uh, make it for sale here at drastically reduced prices. So if you're in the mood for equipment or you want some equipment, uh, you might check with James. He has a lot of great stuff sometimes and it's fairly cheap. So they're trying to figure out why my camera is not on. So anyway, but my camera is on. So anyway, um, uh, we also have equipment for rent. So uh, if you don't have the money to buy right away or you'd like to try something first before you actually go in to buy something, we actually have equipment for rent as well. Matter of fact, let 
this just got returned tonight. This is one of those new C Star uh, C Star devices, and uh, it's actually in part of the rental pool now. So you could actually run a C Star and take it home for a week or two or whatever, and try it out and see what you think about it. So someone just uh, brought it back tonight. So I'll give it to James later on. Anyway, so equipment is available for you as well. Uh, if you need to learn some things, we do also have out on the news and resources page, a virtual beginner's lab. You can click on any one of those blue uh, uh, boxes there and it brings up a, essentially a PDF that teaches a little something about astronomy. And there's probably like 30 or 40 or 50 of those little blue boxes on this page and you can work through. Uh, we also run hands-on classes as well. Um, James actually does those. Uh, he has an assistant, a young guy named Ben that actually helps him. Uh, once James sees there's interest, you, you basically we let him know you're interested. When he gets four or five people, he puts a class together, and the uh, classroom sessions are over Zoom, so you don't have to travel anywhere. But then they usually do at least a couple of actual events somewhere, sometimes out in the grass here by the, the, the observatory or whatever, where you actually have hands-on portions of the class with your telescope, and he'll show you how to work, work things. Um, also, if you want to join and give back, uh, one of the charters of this club is to give back to the community. So we have a couple different ways we can do that. One of the ways is actually to work over here at our observatory. And so you, uh, we are open every Friday and Saturday night from, from dusk till about 930. And what you can do is you see the email address up there. You can sign up uh, to be part of that email address. And then Claude, who's our observatory manager, will send out an email. Uh, at the end of every month saying, hey, who wants to work next month and what nights can you or can't you work? And so if you want to work that next month, you say, yeah, I want to work Greco next month. Or if you don't, you're on vacation, you're traveling, whatever, you just wouldn't respond. And you tell them which nights you could or could not be there, and then you can join and be part of the Greco staff. It's actually very rewarding to do so. Another way to get involved is actually with our public star parties. Uh, as a club, we go out to schools, HOA, science centers, everything here in the East Valley. And uh, we, you know, we put on a star party for them and show them the sky through the telescopes and, and whatnot. We take our meteor case out there and show them the meteors and all that. So if you'd like to be involved with that, um, you can see there's an email address there where you can sign up to get on that list as well. And when an event is uh, being scheduled, they'll just send out like an email blast saying, hey, anybody want to work this event? And if you want to, you work it. And if you don't want to, you don't work it. And sometimes it depends on, you know, how busy you are, where the event is located, things like that. It's just a great way, though, to get involved and get to meet people. Um, I like to do this because I've been doing this for two years, doing the public outreach stuff. Um, it just, number one, feels good when you give back. It's like giving a Christmas gift to somebody and you, you all light up and they smile and they're happy to get their gift. Or you're giving people the gift of the sky. And so it's just a lot of fun to, to see people light up. You know, the first time they see the rings of Saturn or the cloud bands on Jupiter or they, they see the owl network or whatever it might be. So anyway, um, also, uh, you'll learn a lot more about the sky and telescopes yourself because you're out there doing it. And then last of all, you'll build friendships. So half, uh, not half, I would say nearly everybody I know in this club, I know through these uh, public events. Uh, I met Jeff, for instance, right over there at, uh, at a star party a few months back and then at the Messier event this last week. And uh, Jeff's actually going to join and do some of this public stuff here uh, going forward as well. So a lot of the people I know from these events, it's a great way to meet, meet people and make friends. Okay, if you, I did not do this slide last week because we were really full with our meeting, but I'm going to do this this week to acknowledge people that should be acknowledged. So... Uh, first of all, uh, there's a lot of people that are behind the scenes dedicating a lot of time to making all this happen. So I want to acknowledge some of those people. Uh, number one is Woody Sims, who's actually sitting right here on the phone. He was the one waving over my, my you know, doing incantations over my, uh, my PC here a few minutes ago. Um, anyway, he's our vice president, and he has a very, uh, uh, very joyous task of trying to find speakers for us every month. So like... Jessica. So anyway, uh, so he does a great job of that. We're glad to have Woody here. Uh, Brooke Schofield, our treasurer in the back there. So I've mentioned Brex earlier. Um, James Yoder, our properties and uh, manager and secretary. He does a lot of work for us as well. Uh, Brandon Feldman handles all our web page stuff. So anytime you uh, see something new on the web page, usually Brandon's the guy that's done that. So he's very quick to handle things there. Uh, we have Marty Pazanka. Uh, he does a lot of the newsletter stuff each month for us, so that takes care of that. 
And whoops, I went the wrong way. Uh, Jake Lee Ocala is uh, our events coordinator. So he works with the schools and the HOAs and the science centers or whatever to kind of set up some of these events. And um, uh, let's see what else we have here. Um, if you wanted to contact any of these individuals, all of their email addresses, or at least the aliases for their, their e email, are actually all on our website. So you can find like properties at RSS or VP at us or president at us, whatever, all on our website. And then we always have a board members as well uh, that are always there to provide guidance. So you can see a number of people there, Alex Beck, Don Wrigley, Nathan Esky, Tom Mosden, and Claude Haynes. So these are some of the people that are behind the scenes doing a lot of work for us. Um, uh, hopefully most of you maybe were able to go to the event last weekend. We had our uh, spring star party slash Messier marathon last weekend. Uh, it was actually Saturday night was the, the actual night, but there were several of us out there a few nights earlier, and I think a few people stayed a couple nights later. Uh, we had two nights, of great nights. Uh, Friday was clear, Saturday was clear, a little breezy at times, but the sky was inky black and really clear, and we had a great time. Um, so we had clear skies, as you can see, we had daytime fun. A couple of the guys in the club actually had the paragliders, so they were up paragliding during the day. Um, glam temping, that's actually my yurt. Since I was there a couple of days, I didn't want to sleep on a cot in the midair, so I, I put up a yurt. And then actually uh, a lot of people got some great photos as well. That photo there of the comet, that's actually Comet 12P. And uh, Kevin Kilgore actually took that photo. And so he, it came out really, really nice. So I wanted to give a call out to Kevin Kilgore on that photo. Uh, a lot of astrophotographers photographers out there last weekend. We had a great time. And as you can see, we had about 55 camps or whatever you want to call them set up out there and about 90 people. So it was pretty large, pretty well attended. We had a great time. So anyway, um, we'll have another event coming up, you know, like oct end of October, 1st of November of, of the coming you know, fall. And so hopefully you can join us for that. Um, anyway, Tom, uh, it's uh, we have a member presentation now from Tom Falakis, and uh, I'm going to turn the mic over to him and just let him go. So, okay. Uh, so I have a uh, permanent observatory with a 12-inch telescope, 12 and a half-inch telescope. Um, and it's a uh, roll-off in an 8 by 10 roll-off observatory, and it's at the uh, dark site known as Mill and Southern um, near ASU. So I have to do stuff other than pretty pictures if I'm going to be imaging. Typically, I do photometry, asteroids, sometimes variable stars, that sort of thing. But this will be a little different. Hopefully, this is not an intimidating presentation. So... This is what you typically think of in time-lapse imaging, where you're, you're using maybe an hour you know, or even minutes or even seconds to show things moving, to speed things up. And so these are four examples of time-lapse stuff that I've done over the years. Um, but something that caught my interest, and I did a presentation here three or four years ago, a half a presentation anyway, on doing long-term time-lapse imaging where now instead of uh, minutes, seconds, or hours, it's decades or even over a century in some cases to watch things change that are way out of the outside of the solar system. And that's what this presentation is going to be about. So here's an example of that. Uh, this is one of the nebulae that's near the central star, the center star in Cassiopeia near Gamma Cassiopeia. And in most cases, what I do is I use an image from the Palomar Sky Surveys. They did two runs of this in the mid-50s and then in the early 90s. So you take the best image you can find, and then you combine it with one of your images. And here we can see that this emission nebula over the course of 32 years is moving across the sky. So that's kind of the theme of, of what I'll be talking about. But before I get into that, this is a real important part of the presentation is to me one of the greatest astronomical accomplishments almost up there with the Webb Space Telescope and the Hubble Space Telescope is the Gaia mission that the European Space Agency put up. And it's not really pretty pictures, but it's a, just an amazing space mission. What it has done is measured uh, distances, motions across the sky, and brightnesses in three colors, photometry of 
of 1% of all the stars in the Milky Way. So, and that's 1.3 billion stars with a B, and probably at least half of these are very accurate measurements until you start getting out to larger distances. And I'll show you the size of that. So here's a top view of our galaxy, of the Milky Way, and what is that radius? Oop, what is that radius? There's uh, the radius that we have accurate results. So even with the best spacecraft doing the best position measurements of stars ever in history, this is all the farther we can go out in our galaxy. And that's the 1% of these stars. Maybe the diameter would be double that, but the accuracy falls off quite a bit once you get outside of that diameter. And so the precision of the measurements is measured in fractions of a milli arc second, which is an angle so small you almost can't imagine it. And the way I would like to visualize it is when you see a shadow transit of Ganymede going across Jupiter, that angular size is 1500 milli arc seconds. So imagine one 1500th of that diameter. And that's the type of precision that you have with these measurements that are coming out of the Gaia spacecraft. And this is so useful astronomically, not, I mean, a little bit for me as an amateur, but professionally, people will be using this the way they use the sky survey now, the two Palomar sky surveys, still very useful. They'll be using these decades out, I'm certain of it. There's so much value in those in having that amount of data. So let's look first at my animation of Barnard star. Stop doing that. Oop, easy to go too far. So every year I go out, this is one of the easiest projects that I do. I just make sure I have to, I just have to remember to do it. I take an image of Barnard star, which has the highest proper motion of any star in that, that's in the Milky Way galaxy. So it's not only very nearby, in five or six light years, but it also has a high motion. It's a halo star that's moving very fast across our line of sight. Um, so you can see that V-shaped asterism down at the bottom. When I began in the hobby, it was most of the way in 1977 down to that V. And during a typical human lifetime, it moves about half of the angular size of the full moon, about a quarter of a degree. Um, so what can we do with Barnard star? Now we'll get into the catalog data part of the talk. We can take two positions that are that are my images eight eight years apart, and then you can get accurate positions. They call it astrometry, and find out what's the angular dimensions, both in declination and in right ascension. And we can compare that to the catalog. And so you can ignore everything except for that last column, the last four columns, I should say, and the proper motion to the east and the north from my observatory, which has the designation V02, is compared to uh, Gaia, these measurements that are the official measurements that are to real high precision. And I'm within a few tenths of a percent of, uh, so it's just kind of, it doesn't have any value scientifically, but it's just kind of, Gee whiz, look at I can do at my little backyard observatory if I'd stick with things. So at that distance of six light years, it's moving 200,000 miles per hour. So even though it just moved that far in the sky in those eight years, that's 200,000 miles per hour. And Americans will do anything to avoid the metric system. So that's the unit I'm using. Okay, so what I thought I would do is try, uh, they call it the Heart and Soul Nebula, IC 1805, which is an emission nebula with a cluster, not my image. This is by Chuck Ayub, and I'm only using it as a context for my field of view, which is a lot narrower. My backyard observatory camera has a three quarter by half a degree field of view. So in the next slide, you'll see that rectangle. This is my image of that. So in this case, I know I'm at the, a place where you can't even see the Milky Way on the, on the best of nights, but you use a hydrogen alpha filter and it isolates this uh, nebula very well from, the, from all the street lights, all the glow that we have. So that's a 2023 image. Here's a 1955 image. 
I wasn't alive in 1955. Um, that was done by the Palomar Sky Survey, the first run of it. And then I can animate between the two of those. And voila, there is no motion in the nebula. And the reason, and I didn't look this up first, is that it's 7,500 light years away. So things could really be moving fast, but it's so far away that you're just not gonna see motions at this limit of resolution. But what you can see in these images, they're 7,500 light years, by the way, out in the next spiral arm over, out in the Perseus arm, and here's where it's located next to Cassiopeia. So what you can see at this distance, not at this distance, but in the foreground, are all the stars that are moving um, with high proper motion. And hopefully you can see that all the way to the back of the room. I've circled all of these high proper motion stars. So there is something I can do with these, with this pair of images that are separated by 68 years. I can look at these high proper motion stars. And what I've done here, there's a, one of the things a lot of the pretty picture takers, not me, are doing is they're removing all the stars from their images. There's really cool software um, that'll take all of the stars and just leave you with the nebula. So what I did was took all of the stars out except for the ones that have high proper motion. And I thought that might make it a little bit easier to see, especially if you overlay a grid on that. So now you can see all these stars and east is to the left, south is down, which should be the case in every picture ever taken by astronomers, but it's not. Um, um, sorry, Woody and Bob like that. Um, so they all seem to be moving down to the southeast. So the little project I embarked on was hey, maybe these things are actually related. Maybe these are, this is a moving group. This is a cluster of stars. And I've made a discovery and it'll be Palakis 1 someday. Um, but that ended up not being the case. So now we're gonna look at all of these where I've numbered 25 of these stars. And I'm gonna look each one of them up in that same Gaia catalog. So this is gonna tell me how far away it is, the parallax and then I can get the proper motions in both directions. If I know what those proper motions are from that star catalog, then I can make vectors that are gonna represent each of these proper motions and it's gonna look like that. And disappointingly, it's not a moving group. It's not a physical association because if it were, they would have almost identical proper motions and they'd have identical distances and neither of those are the case. So I put one scale bar, just an exaggeration. There's 10 arc seconds in those 68 years. Um, so you can see that it's just a lot of stars that are moving fast, but they are not associated. Um, if we take these and say, what's their actual proper, what's their actual physical motion across the sky and we adjust for distance, then we get a um, plot that looks something like that. So they're sort of random but I thought it was interesting to do anyway. Um, there's one other little thing you can do with this is uh, here's my uh, almost starless version of the nebula with just the highlighted, highlighted high proper motion stars. Since I know their actual brightness or their perceived brightness and their distance, I can get their absolute magnitude. I can get their actual luminosity. And then I can say, here's what these stars look like in my image, and here's how bright they really are. So the brightest of those stars is, is just that guy in the lower right part of the frame has an absolute magnitude of 1.6. The sun is a little bit fainter than four. And then the faintest star in there has an absolute magnitude of nine. So you can kind of make a star chart from this Gaia data, which is the next thing I'm gonna show. So I'm gonna move past that slide and go on to uh, one of my favorite open star clusters in Cancer. Cancer is kind of an upside down Y, and right at the junction of that Y is a very wide, splashy open cluster called the Beehive, Messier 44, and it has this prominent V, and it shouldn't even be subtle here. They can see quite a few stars in this open cluster are all moving north and east. Right? or I should say south and west, they're, they're moving in 2024 image earlier this year. They've all moved down and to the right in that pair of images. So we can do some stuff with catalog data here. 
um, is get past this wordy thing, other than to point out that this is a lot closer at 600 light years instead of 7,500 light years. So we should be able to see a lot of uh, motion, and we do. So what I did was highlighted all of the cluster member stars, all of the bright ones anyway, that are in the image. And then here's the non-members. So these are ones that are just kind of moving in random directions, and they're definitely not cluster members because they are not moving with the association. So let's look next at uh, four of these stars that I selected. And here I'm just doing the same thing as Barnard star and just comparing what I calculated as the motions versus what's in the best star catalog in the universe, the Gaia 3 catalog, and did pretty well with that. So what I thought was kind of cool is uh, we think of the beehive cluster as being one degree across. When you look at it with binoculars or a telescope, um, it's, uh, it's about one degree. You just see stars out. But how big is it really? And so I took the Gaia catalog and put some constraints on it for how far away the stars are and which direction and how fast they're moving in that direction and made a six degree circle and said, how many stars is it gonna find in that six degree circle? And this is my table that came out of it and it has over a thousand stars in it. And what you can do if you know the magnitudes of the stars and their positions on my image or, or not on my image, you can make a star chart from this and with the actual brightnesses. So that little V that's in my image is this tiny thing in the middle of the, of the middle of the star chart that I created entirely from catalog data. This diameter is six degrees. So we think of the beehive as this little thing and it's actually, and this is true of all of these open clusters and globular clusters, what we see in a telescope or even in our images is usually just a fraction of the actual size when you have all these outliers. And some of them that are a couple degrees from the center are, would be easily, easily seen in a telescope. So there's a plot of the constellation Cancer, the upside down Y. There's, our, there's a one degree circle, or maybe a little bit one and a half degrees for M44. And its actual size is at least that size, across that uh, six degree diameter across the sky. All from just using catalog data. Finally, what I've done here is highlighted, I, I made that star chart. This is a zoomed in version of the star chart with my image blinking over the top of it. And so you'll see a number of stars in my image that are not in the chart. Those are all non-members of the Beehive cluster. It's just a way of looking at that stuff you can do. All right, and finally, or actually second to last, Messier 27 is the Dumbbell Nebula. Uh, all of these large and nearby planetary nebulae are expanding. And with people who do spectroscopy, where you take a spectrum and you see how much the lines shift, can tell you how fast that it's expanding toward us, right? By seeing how much redshift or blue shift in that case that you have. So we know those velocities pretty well. I'm gonna take an alternative approach to finding out how fast it's expanding. Um, so here's a pair of images. In this case, this is really cool. If you get on, on, sometimes you just do a Google search and you'll find historical photos from like Mount Wilson from the 100 inch or the 60 inch telescope, uh, historical images from way back just after the turn of the century. And so the images of poor quality from 1918 but it shows the largest motion between the two images. And so you can see definite expansion in every direction. So what I'm gonna do here is just take this little corner in my inset figure, try to measure how many pixels it's expanded. And I know it's a nebula, so there's not really any sharp parts of it that you can measure off of, but using my scientific measurement, it's about five pixels. So from that, if I know the distance and I know the baseline, the, the time that's elapsed, I should be able to figure out what the velocity is. And I got 33 kilometers per second. And from a study of the planetary's expansion spectroscopically, they got 32. This was just beginner's luck that I'm within a factor of like 1.0 something. 
because then I did it for a number of other planetaries that I did the same exercise. And this factor over here is my comparing my measurement, uh, what I think is the velocity versus what the velocity from spectroscopy. They're still pretty good. A lot of them are within 50%. And even if I'm within a factor of two or something, that's, that's kind of cool. Another bit of gee whiz science. So finally, the Messier one, I did exactly the same type of exercise and didn't do quite as well with the results. Here's a 1909 image of it. And then my image from 2020. And we're gonna use a feature that's there that expands out to there between those two years and try to calculate the, the velocity, like how much has it expanded angular, we know the distance, should be able to figure out what the velocity is. And then we can even use 1054 when, when the supernova that created the, uh, the, the supernova remnant that we observed today in the Crab Nebula, we can use that distance and try to get the velocity from it. And so I did it both ways. There's using 1054, I'm getting about 1100 or 1200 kilometers per second if I use the more recent data. Um, and the published value is 1500. And I, I just, I couldn't really do much better than that with, with what I had available. So I know this, this is kind of an advanced talk and it had an intimidating title, but hopefully some of what I said was understandable. And, um, and it's the kind of stuff that I like doing from my backyard. My backyard, uh, I lose three magnitudes due to light pollution. The, the whole Bortle thing is kind of nonsensical scale. So you try to do an estimate of what magnitude, how much are you losing? That's what really matters. And I'm losing three magnitudes. I can see fourth magnitude naked eye on a good night. So you have to come up with something that's uh, hopefully more creative and then try to do measurements or something because I just can't compete with people who go out in the field. And if I go out in the field, I'm gonna screw something up every time. So. I know better than to try to do that anymore. Um, anyway, I hope that's, uh, I, that's my talk and I hope y'all liked it. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. Uh, we'll take some questions, E. So, so Tom, I mean, if you take a dumbbell nebula, right? <clears throat> it's clearly not spherically symmetric. So if you're measuring if you take a, a sample from the left side, the velocity that you measure may be different than what people, if you, if you take the other front, for example. <clears throat> so, so dumbbell is not spherically symmetric. Right. So some of the material is moving faster yeah. in one way than the other, right? So if, you, if you're off by a factor of two, that could be that could be that you pick one that was too slow, for example. Okay, yeah, that's that's a good explanation. And none of this was, is going to get published in a journal. Oh, I know, I know. It's not getting by you. It's certainly not getting by the referees. <laughs> Other questions for Tom? Tom, I've got a question for you. Uh, you don't get off so easy. How did you go about scaling these uh, archival images with your images so that you could overlay uh, the stars? Um, there's a few tools out there. I didn't use uh, any plate solving type of thing, astrometric solutions. Um, there's uh, the name of the software I use is called Registar. It does exactly one thing and it registers images and does a really nice job of it. So you can take this archive image and what I do in my usual kludgy manual way of doing things I take the two that have grossly different scales and sometimes even orientations or always like they're rotated a little bit. And I sit there and Photoshop with the transform tool and just play around with it until I can get them close. And then after you do that, they never line up because there's warpage, there's distortion, barrel and pin cushion distortion and whatnot across the plate and across my image. So then you use Registar and you just take the two images and it does this beautiful job of aligning them. And it doesn't get confused by the high proper motion stars. It, it just puts them together. And so usually that's what I do. There's a whole routine that I go through to do these, but I've kind of exhausted what I can do, honestly, because once you get past several hundred light years, then 
there's no way you're going to see differences in a galaxy between the two images and much less even a near a 7,000 light years away object is you can't see it. So. Uh, any other questions for Tom? Thank you, Tom. Good evening. Thank you for coming. I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight, Jessica Berkheimer. She's a PhD student in astrophysics at ASU. She got her bachelor's degree in astrophysics there. Her research experience includes measuring the zodiacal light as part of Project SkySurf. Using ground-based instrumentation and radar, she studied atmospheric gravity waves and their roles in transporting momentum through the upper atmosphere over the Arctic Ocean. Her main area of interest and study is globular clusters. She uses Python for photometry and looks for compact objects in JWST images. She just published a paper about the globular cluster population around the distant galaxy VV191A. You're all familiar with that, right? They found 154 globular clusters around a galaxy 700 million light years away. She enjoys doing astronomy outreach programs and loves getting people excited about science. She also enjoys baking, oil painting, and playing the piano. Let's have a round of applause and welcome Jessica. All right, well, th what this is, this is a project called Sunspotters. Um, and they look at archival images of the sun and identify sunspots. Um, you have this one, which is burst chasers, and I think that that's just looking at gamma ray bursts. Um, this one's my project, and it got it got put in with the the space projects for some reason. Not complaining, but I. Um, so yeah, and, and there's tons. There's ones where you can, there's Galaxy Zoo, and that one's a really popular one that I used to do when I was a, a kid. And it's, you just look at the different galaxies and you can say, is it a spiral? Is it an elliptical? Is it, you know, is it a blob? Like, so it, it's, it's a really fun one. Um, okay, so let's give it a try. I'm going to talk a little bit about Gravity Wave Zoo, which is the name of the citizen science project that I made. Um, there are three main aims for the project, and it is to identify gravity waves, instabilities, and breaking, and learn what conditions are needed for these events to take place. And it is also to compile a multiple year uh, study to see what the seasonal variations are that cause these events. Okay, how are images of gravity waves captured? So the imager that we use um, that's collecting our data is at the Poker Flat Research Range in Fairbanks, Alaska. And the imager is an OH airglow imager um, that, glues in, uh, that views in the infrared. It resolves small scale gravity waves and instabilities near an altitude of 86 kilometers. Uh, to put that into perspective, um, I included this image, 86 kilometers is right here on the edge where the satellites are. Um, that's equivalent to stacking 10 Mount Everest, one on top of the next. Um, and to also put into perspective, airplanes, uh, commercial airplanes fly at about eight to six miles above sea level. So it is really high up there. And what we're actually measuring is the air glow. Um, air glow is a faint luminous that occurs really high in the atmosphere. You can kind of see it here. This is that really faint green layer around around the Earth at night. And um, so when, when excited OH emits in the infrared, um, a narrow uh, layer centered at 86 kilometers um, is what we are looking, th that's where the gravity waves are being perturbed and the at the level that we're we're viewing because we're seeing waves there's not clouds up there it's way too high to see clouds it's it's literally just the um, glow layer the layer that's right above the earth that's being perturbed and we that's where we see these waves this is a gravity wave that is with clouds the the waves we're looking at are too high to be clouds um, but this is this is what it looks like. And often the word uh, gravity 
in gravity waves can be confusing to people. Um, it has little to do with gravity so much um, as a special relationship since all air motion is influenced by gravity. Um, once the word gravity is removed, it's just a wave. And the best example I like to think of is when you drop a stone in a pond and you get the ripples going outwards. It's, it looks like that. And uh, for a gravity wave to start, something has to um, trigger the air to be displaced vertically. And that's usually a, a high mountain range or a, uh, a thunderstorm, uh, updraft thunderstorm. And it has to be forced into a stable air layer because if the, if the layer is not stable, then the wave will just keep rising and it won't have a chance to form the wave pattern. So as the momentum keeps uh, the air molecule going forward um, and, and it keeps overshooting its equilibrium point, and that's what we perceive as a um, propagating oscillation um, as a gravity wave. And so I have a quick video that kind of hopefully works that shows it. kind of gives gives it a good uh, picture. Oops. Okay, so another thing that we look at in Gravity Wave Zoo is at the instabilities. Um, and I'll just say real quickly that instabilities are the little ridges that appear perpendicular to gravity waves. Um, they're caused by wind shear blowing perpendicular to the wave. And um, gravity waves do not have to be present for instabilities to occur. And I'm telling you, now that you have a look at these, when in the air, out in Gilbert, you'll every time you look at the clouds, you're going to be like, ah, there's gravity waves, and and there are also instabilities up there. You will not ever not see it now. And um, we all are pretty familiar with aurora, but if you aren't sure of it, here is an image. They are brightly colored bands visible around Earth's geomagnetic poles. They're caused by solar wind interacting with particles in Earth's magnetic field. They're quite beautiful. Um, in our images, though, they are kind of black and white, but this is what an aurora would look like. Okay, so let's practice. Um, ho hopefully the, the video will, my, my link will work for us to be able to, to participate. But here is... Okay, we're gonna ask ourselves, are there gravity waves? Are there instabilities present? And are there aurora? Yeah. Yes, very good, A plus. Yes, yes and yes to all. Very good, that is right. Um, there are gravity waves, instabilities, and aurora. Okay, so this is hopefully, if you wanna take out your phones and um, use your uh, camera, you can connect to, to the QR code. I really hope it, it's going to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got it? Okay, cool. All right, so here we go. We're going to first watch this video. 
And keep in mind, we're going to be looking for gravity waves, instabilities, and aurora. Okay. The options come up. Ah. Let me see. I'm sorry, I'm trying to find out. Ah, uh, is it is it not working? It, yeah, it's supposed to, yeah, I'm so sorry. All right, we're, we're going to have to just ra do a raise of hands then. All right. <laughs> yeah, okay. So are there gra gravity waves present in that video? Everybody who thinks there were, raise your hand. You got it. Great, that's right. Okay. Um, sure. Mm-hmm. That's a, yeah, that's a good question. Um, gravity waves are always going to be a lot bigger. Um, the instabilities, I kind of like to use the description that they look kind of like the backside of a package of hot dogs on the gravity waves, um, perpendicular. Um, the gravity waves will be much larger. They'll have larger horizontal wavelengths. Um, it is. It is, yeah. Yeah, they 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 travel perpendicular. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, so now um, in this video, do we see any instabilities? That's right. We're good. Okay. How about Aurora? Good job. You guys are you guys are excellent pros. Okay, since my since my poll didn't work, sorry about that. Okay, let's try another one. You ready? Mm. Who who wants to vote on? Uh, do we have gravity waves? So to raise your hand if you think we do. Oh, I should also um, mention that the, a, a way that we have our volunteers help them to feel a little bit more confident in, in what they're looking at is we kind of say, okay, gravity wave, you're looking for at least light, dark, light, dark, a pattern of at least that many light, dark, light, dark. Well, not they, they are moving, not, not necessarily as fast as that first video I showed you, but yes. So what we we have right here, we have these are gravity waves. Boop, boop, boop. No instabilities in this one though. Yeah, that's right. And Aurora. So and and I, I find that I get a lot of questions from people that are concerned about answering correctly. Um, and what I what I, I tell people is you know, if you're trying your best, then it's going to be good. And there are, with uh, citizen science, there's power in numbers. So for every data image we have, we have 10 people classify it. And that way, you know, if somebody's like, I don't, I don't think so. And so we have six people that say yes. And then four people that say no, we'll probably look at it ourselves. But, you know, if eight people say yes and two people say no, we're going to say it's probably yes. Somebody's, you know. So I always just tell people, you know, there's power in numbers and your helping is all that really matters as long as you're trying your best. It's okay if you get them wrong sometimes. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, people are usually, they're either really good at getting it and they're like, oh yeah, there's waves. Or, or when the people are confused, those are the ones that we set aside and look at our 
ourselves. And sometimes it is really confusing. Sometimes there's just turbulence and there it looks like there's waves going in every which way, but it's a mess. And those are also really interesting nights. We look at the confusing images and they're just as value, valuable as images that are a solid yes or a solid no. Um, they're, they're all, it's all useful. And I tell people that too. Don't worry, even the confusing nights are good. I think, is this a different one? Oh, that's our same one, okay. Yeah, sorry about the poll. Um, anywho, so why is this research important for this project? Um, well, gravity waves, uh, they affect, they have huge effects on the climate system and our, the, the climate system and tremendous and varied effects. And they also carry a lot of energy and momentum through the atmosphere. Um, they are closely related to severe weather phenomena, such as downed, um, downslope windstorms and clear air turbulence. Um, gravity waves also have the potential to create significant impacts in, in aviation, which ties back to the clear air turbulence. Um, there was this one story that I read that was that took place in like 1996, and Air Force One was taking off uh, from Texas, and it had Bill Clinton on board, and they had just like reached flight altitude. Everybody took off their seatbelts and were just you know free about the cabin, and all of a sudden they had terrible, terrible turbulence. They landed the plane. And when it, the um, media saw inside the plane, it had looked like there was a terrible food fight, like just food everywhere. And when they did an investigation into what had happened, they discovered that um, a distant thunderstorm had caused gravity waves and the plane ran into them and caused that bad turbulence. So if you've ever been in a plane and you suddenly feel like the bump, 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 it's likely your plane is just plowing through gravity waves and... Uh, that's why it's also really important to, um, for aviation purposes to study these. And that is, these are the resources that I use. They're really helpful and um, available like on Amazon and or also at the library. We are at a perfect place for that. And I will, I'll take any questions that anybody has. And thank you for listening. Any other questions? <laughs> so, so or the, the project related to the auroras and so on, obviously, is looking much higher in, in, in the atmosphere than, say, aviation, right? Right, yeah. Because you said planes are at 8,000. And so who is looking at the 8,000 level? Is, is there any, is NOAA looking at the 8,000 level? Who is looking at that level? There are um, there are a lot of satellites that are like looking downwards at them. Our imager is ground based and looking upwards. Is is that what's straight lines at the? Yeah. Oh yeah, exact. Oh yes, I see. Um, and that's another thing is that they they can start down um, like on the orographic level, and they propagate. They have huge vertical wavelengths, which they sends them all the way. Sometimes even into um, the thermosphere, we have seen them like just completely make their way all the way up. So that is yeah. That's why um, they can start down low, and they and they usually do, but they they make their way up and up. There really are. There's, uh, I've seen like plotted um, graphs from other papers and stuff like that um, that are like just plotting like the, the vectors and you know and they're they're really just all over the place. But you know they do need the the conditions to be right to get going. They need that like a, the stable layer to like start. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I have a question. <laughs> Perhaps it related to astronomy. Now, is this a phenomenon that only occurs during daytime, or can it occur at night also? And if it does occur at night, how can that impact the terrestrial uh, astronomical observation? And then last but not least, uh, if it does affect it, can modern innovations such as adaptive optics offset it? 
Um, they do occur during the day and during the night. Um, when the waves that we're observing are in the infrared though, so we can only observe these waves during the nighttime. Um, but if you try to look up at the sky during the daytime in infrared, you see nothing but brightness. Um, so what we're looking at is the night, the nighttime um, waves. But there are gravity waves that take place during you know, all, all hours of day and night. Um, we just can't see the ones during the daytime. And do they um, affect like astronomical viewing? Not so much because they dissipate a lot by the time they're reaching in the very upper atmosphere. Um, like w when they do, or if they do reach the thermosphere, um, and that's an if, they can actually bump into the orbits of satellites. And that's another thing, like they have to, sometimes satellites have to be readjusted because gravity waves can reach that high up, but it's, that's not as, not as frequent. They have to be pretty massive waves to, to propagate up that high. Does that answer all of the questions? Yeah, I'm um, finding it a little confusing. Uh, for a long time, I've had an interest in gravity waves. Not this kind. Oh, I... Uh, I I'm more familiar with the ones coming when black holes collide. Yeah. Uh, different kind of gravity wave. We're talking gravitational waves. Okay, we're going to differentiate that one. Yeah, sorry, there, that's, there's okay. a big difference between gravitational and gravity waves. Yeah, you're talking neutron star collisions. Yeah, those those are those are really cool, but not what we're seeing here on Earth. But sometimes, but not not in this case. Sorry. Is is it uh, correlated with any uh, atmosphere disturbances like tornadoes or hurricanes? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, those kind of those kind of events have huge like cause huge gravity waves. Um, sometimes even planetary waves, but yeah. Um, we, we, especially like when there's, you know, you said hurricanes, um, we see beautiful gravity waves whenever there's like a volcanic eruption, it just sends them sailing across the oceans and yeah. Why would you pick Alaska to be having a site? We picked Alaska because, um, there is the poker flat research range up there. Um, it has a, it already has a nice housing for lots of different um, scientific instruments. So we have a spot where there's a nice dome. Also, we need a spot that has Wi-Fi. Um, we later thought, well, it would have been nice to have it here where in Arizona where there's so many clear nights, um, but it was a little challenging to find a place to keep an imager that wouldn't get melted during the summer. <laughs> but um, yeah. It, it is protected and cold doesn't usually hurt cameras. Okay, we've got a question back here. Gravity, uh, I've seen them once or twice, roll clouds. Are those associated with gravity waves or is that a different phenomena? What kind? Roll clouds, R-O-L-L. -L. Roll clouds. Yeah. Are those the ones that look like big tunnels? Yes. <laughs> those are... Those are similar, yeah. I, I, if you Google gravity waves, like, and you're looking at the images, you'll see a bunch of those popping up too. <laughs> I think, I think that they're they're closely related, but there's just uh, something more special about the roll waves to make them look that way. Okay, we've got an online question. I want to get to next, and then I'll come back to you. Where's the question? <laughs> All right, I don't see it in the chat. Maybe maybe you can find it, Steve. I see. Is it? Uh, I do. Is it the? Why don't you design slash integrate a software subsystem? Uh, just right after a set of images is taken, neural network uh, based a, okay. Oh, I'm sorry, neural network based a classifier of these gravity waves. Okay, so you're talking like machine learning. Is that, 
like a machine learning algorithm to help classify? Yeah, um, that is actually what we intend on doing with a lot of this data that we um, that we get when people are going to classify like, yes, there are gravity waves. We, we intend on taking all these um, different images. And ladies and gentlemen, we have thousands and thousands and thousands of images. So that's why this project is really helpful. Um, and we intend on taking the classifications that say, yes, there's a gravity wave and feeding them into a machine learning uh, program so that we might be able to make um, a little bit quicker work of some of these images and the data that we have um, by just training a machine to look for them for us, but we're not there yet. That's, that's probably gonna come after the project has concluded. Good question though. Uh, my question's kind of a follow-up on the first question that uh, these high OH band gravity waves that you're studying right now, they're induced by lower atmospheric gravity waves. Is that correct? Yeah, atmospheric gravity waves. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. And so are they a good um, indicator of clear air, clear air turbul yeah. turbulence? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. They're often very closely related, which is why we like to try to keep an eye on them for aviation uh, purposes. Um, if we can make better models to predict them, then it's you know it's going to help aviation greatly. Okay, thank you. I have a question following the question, the previous question. Um, what's the time period that an observer is seeing these images after they're taken and how long do these gravity waves typically uh, stay in that location? Um, they can, they could go for uh, hours and like hours and hours. Usually we'll see if it's a good night, we could see gravity waves that are, you know, going for six hours before they start to um, break and dissipate. Uh, sometimes, they're only there for, you know, three hours. So they're they're more short term than say like a planetary wave that's you know, several days long. It's they're they're shorter. And and I guess the first part of that is your citizen scientists participants. Um, what's the delay in them seeing that image? Well, it's just. Um, as quickly as I can get the images processed um, and flattened and turned into a video and loaded into the project. <laughs> so there's a little bit of behind the behind the scene work because what it's doing is um, we, we use a fisheye lens um, and it's kind of hard to like see gravity waves for in the videos in the fisheye lens. So I have to essentially flatten the images by trying to map like pixel coordinates with geographic coordinates to flatten the images and then I um, and then I turn the images into videos by just a Python code and then I load them into the project. <laughs> They're like big massive waves that are usually um, caused by the rotation of the planet but they'll they'll go around the planet. Uh, a couple of times you mentioned breaking waves. I, I'm picturing it like a wave breaking on the seashore. Is that how these uh, dissipate their energy? Exactly. Yeah, just like oh. a wave in the ocean, they 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 break and then they just kind of get messy and fade away. And it's it's also really neat because sometimes um, people have caught uh, images of gravity waves like from an airplane, so they're look like seeing them edge on, and they actually look really pretty like waves in the ocean, like they have like a crest. And so once they eventually start breaking, the you know the air turbulence will like circle around, and then that's when they start getting messy. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, all of the images you showed us look like they were clouds. Are, is there any way to detect the waves that uh, don't show up as clouds and images? Well, what you're actually seeing, um, there aren't any clouds. 
that's that's what's really neat is that we're we're looking on hopefully clear nights um, way way up high where there aren't any clouds but what we're seeing is that air glow layer um, way up high uh, will get perturbed a gravity wave will go up there and it'll bump into that and that'll actually make the waves in in that layer okay thanks yeah we can definitely tell the difference when the clouds roll in in Alaska because it's it it's a mess <laughs> How many people have participated in a citizen science project? No one? Bob, you have. You do it all the time. I think that counts. Has anyone else participated in a citizen science project? One hand back there. Seti? Oh, nice. Okay. Good for you. Why haven't you participated in a citizen science project? Anybody going to participate in this project? All right. Okay. Good work. Well, thank you. well done. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, let's have a hand for our speaker. All right, everybody. Thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, that's it for the evening.